Nestled in the bustling streets and high-rises of Norfolk, Virginia, sits a little-known reminder of an era in which redcoats, rebels, and Union soldiers marched through the town, tall ships sailed the harbor, and the sounds of cannon fire ripped through the air. From the time it was first conceived in 1794 by the direction of President George Washington to the present day, the fort has lived through its fair share of change. This program looks at the history of one of the best preserved War of 1812 forts and explores the role it played in the tapestry of American history. Prior to the Revolutionary War, settlers constructed an earthen fort one mile from the city of Norfolk on the banks of the Elizabeth River. While the fort was stocked with stores of ammunition and guns lay at the ready, the fort was not properly manned, so when the Revolutionary War broke out, the British fleet had no problem sailing past its meager defenses to enter the Norfolk Harbor. Norfolk was captured by the British in May of 1779. Congress would not support anything that President Washington wanted to do about building an army for defense. The compromise was coastal fortifications. And President Washington, during his administration, ultimately got the Congress to approve a series of coastal forts to protect the United States from invasion. This is one of the United States' first major efforts to make a system of coastal defense along the United States. And it fits into a system of forts that evolves all the way through the Civil War. In March of 1794, President Washington appointed John Jacob Ulrich Rivardi as the temporary engineer to draw a plan for fortifying the harbors of Baltimore, Alexandria, and Norfolk. Arriving one month later, Rivardi began construction on what became known as Fort Norfolk. By May 5, 1795, equipment and men from the fort now had the mission to quarantine vessels as they entered the harbor. The fort was manned for a short period of time while the possibility of going to war with France was on the horizon. However, the issue was diffused by President John Adams and the French. With not much at stake, the fort was all but abandoned a short time later. That is, until an international incident brought the fort back to life. In June 1807, one of only six frigates in the U.S. Navy fleet, the USS Chesapeake, had set out for the Mediterranean Sea from the Gusbert Shipyard in Portsmouth, Virginia, when it encountered the HMS Leopard. When they got to Cape Henry, there was a, a British fleet there, and one of them, the HMS Leopard, called the Chesapeake to heave to, which the Chesapeake did um, for a message, and there was a, a English lieutenant who came on board the Chesapeake and ordered the Chesapeake to let the Brits uh, inspect the crew because the English had um, information that there were four deserters from the Royal Navy that um, needed to be captured. Um, Commodore Barron said, what a ridiculous thing to do to a um, U.S. naval warship, and hell no. So then the British fired. Um, the Chesapeake was not prepared. Um, Barron was wounded. Uh, a couple of uh, American sailors were killed. Um, and uh, the Chesapeake had to haul down its flag. It got off one shot. The British sent another officer back to the Chesapeake who asked for and received the ship's muster roll. Then, with nearly 400 American sailors mustered on the deck of their warship, the British lieutenant removed four sailors from the Chesapeake. Vowing that the fort would again be armed in the defense of the harbor, the citizens of Norfolk formed committees to ensure the fortifications of Fort Norfolk were repaired. President Jefferson also went to Congress to get appropriations to upgrade the forts defending the maritime frontier. Once again, slave labor was employed to bring the fort back to life. Only this time, the fort would undergo a dramatic change. From a simple earthen fort 
to an earthwork and masonry fortification with brick buildings. On June 18, 1812, President James Madison asked Congress to declare war against the British. During the War of 1812, um, the USS Constellation was in the Chesapeake Bay and headed out into the Atlantic when it was surprised by a British war fleet uh, which came into uh, the Chesapeake and the Constellation ran up the, the Elizabeth River behind Fort Norfolk and Fort Nelson to protect it from being captured. On June 22, 1813, the British again made an attempt to invade Portsmouth and Norfolk. However, they were stopped at the mouth of the Elizabeth River at Craney Island because of a temporary fort in place, manned in part with reinforcements from Fort Norfolk, Fort Nelson, and the USS Constellation. The Virginia militia and a few um, army soldiers and Marines and the gunmen from the USS Constellation um, fought to defend against the attack by the Brits, and we won. In the end, a group of 724 militiamen, soldiers, Marines, and sailors stood against an invading force of some 4,000 British troops. The battle was one of a handful of outright land-based victories during the War of 1812. After the War of 1812, President James Monroe commissioned a study which deemed Old Point Comfort a more suitable place to protect the ports of Hampton Roads and Richmond in addition to Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Fort Monroe would become the main shield of Chesapeake Bay, rendering both Fort Norfolk and Fort Nelson unnecessary. They were all but abandoned in 1824. Fort Norfolk received an interesting caretaker in the mid-1840s. We have a record of a hermit who moved into the abandoned buildings. And we have a record where um, he was thrown out of the buildings and objected and sent a bill to the War Department for um, paying for the maintenance that he did when he lived in uh, the old Fort Norfolk buildings. His name was Lemuel Fentress. Shortly after Mr. Fentress was evicted from the property, the U.S. Navy eyed the fort to serve in a new capacity. Fort Norfolk just sat there. But the Navy discovered Fort Norfolk as well. Um, there was no Norfolk Naval Base. The Gosport shipyard was the shipbuilding yard and the naval base for the Mid-Atlantic and it was booming. There was one small problem. The Navy stored its gunpowder and ammunition adjacent to the naval fleet and the shipbuilding activity at the yard. Many believe that having stockpiles of gunpowder and munitions stored nearby was hazardous to the ships in port. This was the most important shipyard uh, that we had and it was threatened by all those munitions. So here is the abandoned Fort Norfolk and they decided to use Fort Norfolk as a naval weapons station. The Navy needs places to assemble shells, uh, so they, they need a place that's safe, that's going to be far away from uh, downtown Norfolk, but near enough uh, to the ships that it's going to serve. In 1849, the Navy moved into Fort Norfolk and found it served as an ideal spot for them to assemble, store, and load munitions onto ships. They considered it a location safe for both the Gusbert Shipyard and the city of Norfolk. During the 1850s, the Navy got the money to build a magazine specifically designed to handle the gunpowder and munitions properly. They used the parade ground in the middle of Old Fort Norfolk to build their magazine, and the Navy op operated this as a remote location a couple of miles from the Gosport shipyard right on the Elizabeth River with a pier where the ships could come, come and load up their weapons and their munitions. The magazine at Fort Norfolk served in the role of assembling, storing, and loading naval munitions for ships for almost five years. That was until the Civil War broke out and the Virginia militia seized the fort for the Confederacy.
April 17, 1861, just five days after the shelling of Fort Sumter in South Carolina, Virginia voted to secede from the Union, setting into action the next chapter of Fort Norfolk's history. After the firing of Fort Sumter, Virginia State Militia starts seizing all the government assets around the Hampton Roads area, uh, and they take over the uh, take over the fort as, and start fortifying it as a protection from the river in case the U.S. Navy tries to force their way back into Norfolk and Portsmouth. On April 19, 1861, several companies from the Norfolk area seized Fort Norfolk to take care of obtaining the magazine full of munitions. One of these companies was the United Artillery Company that was formed from a volunteer fire department known as the United Fire Company of Norfolk. These men became the artillery company that was stationed at Fort Norfolk for the entire year that Fort Norfolk was occupied by the Confederate Army. A total of 15 cannons were trained on the Elizabeth River to protect the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth from a naval attack by Union forces. The guns at the fort never fired upon any Union ships because the Union Navy remained out of range, blockading the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay near Fort Monroe. Fort Norfolk, however, played a key role in one of the most significant contests in naval history, the Battle of the Ironclads. When the CSS Virginia in March of 1862 uh, sailed out of the Navy Yard up the river, it stopped at Fort Norfolk, was loaded up with um, uh, cannonballs and munitions and sailed on its maiden voyage right out into the harbor and took on the U.S. Navy, the wooden Navy, um, sinking the USS Cumberland right off Newport News Point and then sinking and burning the um, USS Congress in the first day, March 8th, um, 1862. The fort's connection with the famous battle did not stop at powder and munitions. The Virginia was short about 31 men, and it stationed at Fort Norfolk was the United Artillery Company. And they called for volunteers from the United Artillery Company, and they went on board the Virginia and manned the guns. The day after the first battle and the sinking of the Cumberland and Congress, the CSS Virginia encountered a formidable opponent waiting in the waters off Hampton Roads, the USS Monitor. The four-hour battle between the two ironclads ended in a draw, but it was the cannonballs, munitions, and men from Fort Norfolk that helped play an important role in changing the design of naval ships from that day forward. A few months after the historic Battle of the Ironclads, the Union Army landed in Ocean View and marched toward Norfolk taking control of the city and surrendering Fort Norfolk back into the hands of the U.S. Army. Fort Norfolk was then used in part as a prison housing blockade runners who did not take kindly to their Union capturers. As the Civil War ended, the U.S. Navy once again used Fort Norfolk as a naval powder magazine for a short period of time, but by the mid-1870s, munitions operations moved to another location up the Elizabeth River. After the Civil War, they moved m much of their uh, ammunition assembly down to St. Uh, Julian's Creek, uh, and they have an ammunition factory there. Uh, and they need a bigger facility, they need, because the shells are bigger, and the shells are more advanced, shells are more dangerous. Once again, Fort Norfolk fell into a period of vacancy and neglect. In 1879, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers established a field office in Norfolk, the staff, originally located in the Customs House in downtown Norfolk, outgrew that location and moved to the Federal Building. In 1908, the field office graduated to the status of District Command and continued to flourish in staff and responsibilities. In 1923, the Corps took residence in the buildings of Old Fort Norfolk. It was a little nostalgic because I'm, I'm very much a history buff and really, really sometimes it made you go back in time thinking about, you know, what they went through during the war and the prisoners that were here. Planning for some of Virginia's largest civil works projects took place in the buildings of Fort Norfolk, including the construction of Gathright Dam in the northwestern part of Virginia 
as well as the Richmond Flood Wall, the largest civil works project in the Commonwealth. For 60 years, the fort housed engineers, architects, oceanographers, environmental scientists, as well as support and clerical staff, all working on projects to better the lives of the citizens of Virginia. In 1983, the Corps moved into a brand new office building just outside of the old fort's walls, then returned the fort back to its 1850s identity. Only this time, there were no cannonballs, munitions, or naval powder magazine, just the deeply rooted history of a stronghold that served its nation since the calls of revolution rang out across the land.